vegan is a diet that will uh, avoid all animal products, so a bit stronger than vegetarianism. Uh, they would also avoid milk, uh, I think honey even, um, eggs, things like that that are that are related to animal products. So it's, it's a pretty strong, uh, aggressive type of diet. What these researchers were interested in uh, was would short periods of vegan diets um, be enough to impact some of the health indicators. Um, and so they are not advocating for total veganism, which I think would be a huge life decision. What they're studying in this study was is if you would just, you know, go veganism for a day or two and then pop back to your normal, normal meat eating diet, um, would we still ex expect to see different medical changes? Um, so I think it's a interesting question here. I, I like their design too. It's called a randomized crossover study. Um, they did not have a lot of participants, and that's why we're one of the main reasons people might use non-parametric is because of a, a small sample size. It's not going to meet the criteria of a lot of the assumptions for the more standard statistical tests. Um, you could also do it because of the, the type of variable you're studying is ordinal um, instead of instead of interval or ratio variables. But these participants, I believe they had 21 participants, were randomly assigned to either go on an animal diet or vegan diet. These participants were all on an animal diet to begin with. It wouldn't really work out to have vegans in this study because they might randomly get assigned to the animal diet. And in fact, every one of these 21 is going to be at the animal diet at some point in this study. Uh, so it really doesn't work. But you could have people who have a, a typical meat-eating diet go vegan for a couple days. And those are the those are the population that these researchers are interested in anyway. So it really is a perfect plan to delimit it just to people who have a meat-eating diet already. So what they did, they randomly assigned these 21 participants to one of these two conditions. They had carefully scripted out an animal diet. You might wonder why they don't just let them do their normal diet. They wanted to match the vegan diet as much as possible in some of the some of the ways so that we can tell if it's the actual veganism or they wanted to carefully control this animal diet. People who eat meat might eat have diets that are very different from each other. Uh, so they wanted to standardize that diet. That's a great thing. I'm, I'm very glad that they did that. Um, it'll, it'll help reduce the noise when they test then for differences between these two diets. So they do this diet for three days, um, two, two or three days. I can't remember exactly how they did it. But then they had a washout period. So whatever influence you or effect you got from these two diets, what we want to do is try to kind of erase that so that a couple weeks later, when we now put you in the other group, then we can, um, we can kind of start from scratch. So basically, you have 21 participants, but you get 42 data points because you get 21 data points here, 21 here. Um, what they'll look at is they'll look at each participant's vegan compared to their animal, and then these animal diet compared to their vegan. Uh, they'll be able to do a matched pairs type of test there to reduce a lot of the variation, a lot of the, the bad variation, the, the noise, the, the variation that's going to prevent us from seeing any actual impact. So that's that's the study itself. Um, like I said, it was small, small study. They did use a lot of, um, all of these here are non-parametric. So you have a Wilcoxon rank sum, a signed rank test, uh, Spearman's row instead of a Pearson. So that, that correlation we looked at before uh, with regression, that was a Pearson correlation coefficient. Uh, they often still use the letter R for Spearman because it's, so similar conceptually to interpret, um, but it but it is a different process entirely how they 
calculate that coefficient. It's a non-parametric. Um, they did something here. All p-values were corrected for multiple testing. That's a great thing. Uh, we've seen that already, how important that is, and we're also going to see that next week. They use something called the false discovery rate. Instead of a family-wide comparison, which is what we're going to look, look at, um, I guess this the same week, this family-wide comparison uh, allows us to be a little more conservative against type 1 error. The false discovery rate accounts for the fact that we're making multiple comparisons, but it's not as conservative as the, the family-wide type 1 error. The thought being that because this is a pilot study, we really just want to dive in and explore and find any relationships that might might possibly exist, and then we could come back again with more uh, rigorous confirmatory studies uh, that would be much more restrictive and conservative about type 1. So here we're actually guarding more against type 2 error. We, we want to, if there are effects, if there are impacts of this vegan diet, we want to find it. And so we, we're using a little more, um, I guess, liberal or optimistic uh, way of looking at the um, what we count as a significant discovery here. And you can see also they're using the p-value of 0 0.10, which is higher than, than you typically would see. So if I jump down to their some of their main results here, um, this is where they're looking looking at the for correlations between the different types of diet and the nutrients that were linked to those, and then the different bioindicators that are in in their um, blood plasma. Um, so you're used to looking at p-values now. Um, this is a slightly different format. Uh, basically, you're putting it in scientific notation. This tells you, this power tells you how many places you have to move the decimal. Uh, so for example, 10 to the negative 2 would be two places, 1, 2. So this p-value here was 0 0.0177, while this one was 0 0.00601. Um, now, if they hadn't made a, a large discussion about how they're using false discovery rate, p less than point, I, I would be extremely skeptical. But because it is an exploratory study, that, that does make sense that they're, they're really just trying to give researchers ideas of what are the next steps to take. What, what are the areas where we might want to do um, more studies. So with that intention in mind, this, this was a good way of reporting the results. And they're saying, basically they're saying if they're, they're not bold here, um, don't waste your time. Uh, so the ones that are bolded are ones where there, there's more potential here for further research. Uh, and then when you see things like this, uh, 10 to the negative 8, I mean, these are, even if you did do a very strict correcting for type 1 errors, these would still be statistically significant. So these these connections here are, are certainly present. So here's a question that I want to um, focus on for the, this kind of, it's kind of the central thing I w want you to realize from the video, and it's going to come up here on the, the weekly quiz. Um, this is a small sample study, and they chose to use these non-parametric statistics. Did they do themselves a favor by, by using these non-parametric? In other words, um, if, if I'm uh, curious about these particular amino acids and, and their relationship with a vegan diet, should I be suspicious as a reader of this article Oh, they use non-parametric. Maybe they did that as kind of a data torture thing, the p-hacking thing, something to get a smaller p-value. Um, is this something you should worry about? That they used Spearman rank correlation instead of the typical Pearson correlation uh, coefficient that we would see in a parametric test? And the answer is no. You do not need to be worried about that. So a non-parametric test, like these Wilcoxon ranks, a Spearman rank, um, these are going to make it harder 
to reject the null hypothesis. They're going to make it harder to get a low p-value. Um, if you're able to get a, a low p-value even with a non-parametric test, um, that's great. It's, it's, if anything, even more evidence that uh, there really is a relationship here, that uh, we, we really are legitimately rejecting the null hypothesis, that there's something, something worth studying further here. Uh, if, if you had a large sample, it probably wouldn't matter too much one way or the other. You, you would want to worry about the type of variable. An ordinal variable, even with a large sample, uh, it's probably more appropriate to use one of these non-parametric tests. Um, but in terms, of, in terms of doing yourself a favor or hurting yourself, parametric, non-parametric, for a large sample, it really doesn't matter. For a small sample, uh, the danger of using the non-parametric, if you don't have to, if the variable, if the type of variable doesn't dictate it, um, is that you might not catch a result that really does exist. And in this type of study, this pilot exploratory study, where they're just throwing everything out there and just looking for where, where might we want to explore further, uh, it might even be more dangerous. I, I, I think they probably use this uh, correctly for a couple different reasons, uh, but the danger would be that it would be harder to get a low p-value. So if they actually do get a low p-value with a non-parametric, again, that's more reassurance that there is something actually worth uh, looking at in further research here.